Hi there, I'm Clay Cole, director for the 2017 CHEST Pulmonary Board Review course. To all of you, I want to say thanks for attending our course in Orlando. If you came to get a clinical refresher and update, I hope that you found it comprehensive and pertinent to your practice. For those of you in the final countdown of board preparation for your upcoming examination on October 19th, remember, don't get overwhelmed. Make the most of the remaining time and develop a test preparation strategy that works for you. Many people ask us the best way to prepare for boards. Of course, there's no one right answer for everyone, but I wanted to take you through a few brief test taking tips as you wind up your preparation. Bottom line, our faculty want to make your test day, well, tolerable, and more importantly, make your test result day one for celebration. So with that as a background, I'd like to talk to you about some test taking tips and strategies provided by our faculty over the years. In particular, I'd like to thank Dr. Lisa Morris who provided the bulk of the information that I'd like to share with you right now. As you prepare for the board examination, it's really important that you rely more on study guides and summaries, not necessarily highlighting in a textbook. Passing these examinations requires both knowledge and test taking skills. And so I think it's important to do a lot of practice questions. Uh, an example of those would be the SEEK uh, questions, uh, some of which we introduced to you at the course itself. But simply reading and reviewing is not often enough. Um, when you look at those questions, um, it's not so much important whether or not you get the question right at first. It's more whether or not you understand the rationale for why the question answer is what it is. It's also useful to consider joining or creating a study group. Now, for this year's examination, obviously, that's a little bit late in the process, but certainly if you're looking at taking the 2018 exam, having a regular meeting with a study group where you can either write questions for each other um, or have one or more individuals present specific topics to the others oftentimes will help your recollection of a specific topic. As you self-assess, Review the materials from your board review course. As you go through the materials that we provided to you, it may help jog your memory on a number of different subjects. Practice questions and examinations can definitely help, and I've done that in my own preparation quite a bit. Think about your own training program or practice or where you actually work. Are there holes in your patient populations that you see? In other words, if you're a transplant specialist, you may not see occupational lung disease or even general pulmonary medicine. And so it's important that for your own individual practice that you be honest with yourself and look at where your weaknesses might be. Not all of us are sleep specialists, and that's okay, but we may have to bone up on those areas a bit more than some of the other areas in which we practice quite a bit. Again, it's important to use board type questions it's the old practice like you want to play. Um, so use of seek board review questions um, will be very useful to you um, for the examination itself. So focus on the study, focus your study rather on the areas in which you're least familiar and are emphasized within the blueprint of the examination itself, which we'll share with you shortly. So here is the blueprint. And you can see of each of the different areas, there's a certain amount of emphasis placed for each of those. And what we try to do within the pulmonary board review course itself is to try to focus as much effort in each of the courses, either in terms of allotment of time or emphasis of certain findings as what is presented in the board blueprint. You can see here there's a fair amount spent on obstructive lung disease critical care medicine, diffuse pulmonary parenchymal lung disease, and sleep medicine. There's another uh, portion that's focused on neoplasia, and obviously we've talked about everything from lung cancer to mediastinal tumors. And so in the course itself, we try to proportion the emphasis um, to each of the examination blueprint topics. 
Let's talk a little bit about the exam day schedule. Uh, this is straight out of the uh, ABIM uh, website. And basically what you'll see is it's an eight hour day plus some extra time in there for breaks. Now, the advantage of the current system is you can break up your breaks however you would like. If you're someone who likes a full hour lunch, you can do that. Um, if you're someone that needs really a full 15 to 20 minutes after each one of the sessions, you can do that as well. It's really up to you. The key is, is that there's going to be a total of four sessions, each making up 60 questions and lasting each of those sessions up to two hours in length. So for 60 questions and you get 120 minutes, you don't have to be a uh, physicist or math major to figure out that it's going to be two minutes per question and you're going to need to budget your time accordingly because that tends to get people more than anything else is battling against the clock. So the ge general test format is, and I'm sure most people are aware, that it's they're all going to be multiple choice with the single best answer. There's no penalty for guessing, so we really encourage you to, uh, even if you have no clue as to what an answer might be, go ahead and take a stab at it and just fill it in. For many questions, you're going to need to make the diagnosis and then suggest a treatment or other steps. The question won't be, what is the diagnosis? It'll be what to do next. Now, images are common and important, and that's why we spend a lot of time focusing on that for the course. Review your pathology and radiologic images that we presented within the course as frequently as you can. Now, late-breaking studies really won't be on the exam. Boards are typically at least two to three years behind uh, what we know in current science. And so, again, the focus should be on things that are fairly well uh, embedded into the current medical literature. Now, the format of most questions, out, as outlined by the ABIM, is to make a diagnosis, ordering and interpreting results of tests, recommending treatment or other patient care once you establish a diagnosis uh, from the stem itself, assessing risk, determining prognosis, and applying principles from, say, epidemiologic studies, and understanding the underlying pathophysiology of disease and basic science knowledge. Now, most of the questions are applicable to patient care. There'll be a few of them, particularly those with um, cellular biology, where you'll be kind of rolling your eyes and going, what? This has nothing to do with my practice. Bear with it. The information that we gave you will be extremely helpful in answering those questions. When you look at a question, it's really important that you break that individual question down and make sure that you completely understand what they're asking. In other words, don't jump to conclusions. They'll give you a clinical vignette or other background information, and that's referred to as the stem of the question. Now, it contains all critical information, but remember, there's going to be unnecessary distractors within each of the stems. And the key is you don't want to, you know, be led down a rabbit hole with it and waste a lot of time because you don't have a lot of time. Time is going to be a challenge on the examination if you tend to be a person who overreads each of the questions. The last sentence in the stem or what leads up to the actual question itself is called the lead in. And so it's best to approach the question systematically. First, look at what the question asks by reading the lead-in, and then make sure you look at all the images or any other uh, tables or displays that they give you. Now go back and read the stem looking for important clues. And then finally, come up with the answer in your head and try to find it in, in the options. Some people will try to look at the options after they look at the stem and see what makes most sense. But oftentimes, for some of the questions, you won't even need the full stem. You can just look at the lead-in, and it asks a specific question, as opposed to wasting a lot of time going through the whole stem and then um, looking at the possible options. Now, when you read the question, it's really important that you look for keywords. If they give you something about ethnicity or geography, or like what we've said many times about occupation or exposures, they're telling you that for some reason. There's usually something in the question 
that needs them to clarify that in order to make it make the uh, response most likely. Now you may remember we gave you uh, some synonyms for certain words like current jelly sputum, inspiratory squeak, or the photonegative of pulmonary edema, which as you remember is eosinophilic pneumonitis. So you need to go back and look at those things that we gave you in the course because um, if you recognize those associations, you can quickly respond to the uh, answers on those questions. Again, it's really important to watch your timing. You only get about, well, a max of two minutes per question. So don't let yourself get stuck on one question. Take your best shot and then move on to the next question. Now, from the standpoint of it being an electronic examination, you can always mark questions in which you want to go back and check those. And that's what I tend to do when I take my boards. If you typically have trouble with timing, it's a good idea to do timed practice session at frequent intervals before the examination. And you can use the tutorial on the ABIM page prior to the exam as well, just to kind of get a sense for that. The clock itself, you won't be able to wear a watch uh, into the examination site, but there will be a countdown uh, digital clock on the computer screen uh, that you will need to be aware of um, as you're doing the 60 questions. And for each person, they'll have a different strategy as to how, how they can gauge how well they're doing in terms of rapidity of answering the questions. Now focus on the most likely answer. So the ABIM emphasizes general knowledge over trivia and exceptions. Even though we joke about it a lot in the course, think the classic presentation, all right? Many of the distractor options will be partially correct or, or even plausible, but they really want you to get the most plausible response. You'll need to sometimes compare and contrast. Choose the one that has the most going for it. Make sure there's an epidemiologic fit for those questions in which that's pertinent. The more common disease is typically the right answer. Now, if they do give you something like, for example, a genetic mutation that's associated with it and it seems obvious, then it is. Take that as the answer and move on. Absolutes used in the stem or on detractor, such as always or never or only, are typically incorrect, but you're going to see relatively little of that because professional psychometrists are involved with the examination and you know some of the very poorly written exams in the past are sort of going away. Um, so the, the test is usually relatively well written uh, and most of, the, uh, most of those types of things have been edited out. Now when you're going through the question, triage first. You know, if there's options involving dangerous, invasive, expensive, or potentially harmful choices, you can cross those out typically right away. Oftentimes, the exam will not lean towards doing aggressive surgical procedures without at first doing more safety-sensitive or rather safer, less invasive uh, tests or diagnostic studies first. Now, there will be some difficult question, and you may want to treat each option uh, of the possible responses as a true-false question and cross off the ones that you know are false. And if there's some that are close, pick the one that's most true. Now, question options that grammatically won't fit with the stem are obviously pro or probably not right. We've seen less and less of this problem um, as the tests become uh, more and more reviewed by psychometrists. If there are options that are totally unfamiliar to you, um, you may want to uh, view those as uh, not being correct choices, particularly if you actually have done due diligence and studied. Um, if there are options that contain negative or absolute words, those are typically not going to be correct. Now, again, with difficult questions, um, if there's number questions where there's, you know, an acid-base disorder and they're asking you about um, what, what a, a certain number should be, typically toss out the high and the low question if you have absolutely no clue as to the answer. If two options are similar, they might both 
or probably be incorrect. If two options are opposite of each other, one of them is probably correct. Now, if two alternatives seem correct, you need to look at them like what would be the difference for that, for example, test or procedure B, and then refer back to the stem looking for if there's a term or a way the sentence is written that would lean you more towards having one or the other being correct. Now, because of the time um, challenge on the examination, sometimes you might have to guess. And, you know, always guess if you don't have a clue because there's really no penalty. And it's okay. If you don't have a clue, it doesn't mean you're a poor clinician or, or don't know. Um, there are some things that are difficult on the exam, and you may not have a clue. So use hints from the questions that you know. Remember, you're looking for the best answer, not just a single correct one, because some of them may be similar. Now, if you have absolutely no idea, you've probably heard this on other test-taking strategies, choose A or B, and choose the same one each time you have no idea. Don't change your answers unless you're sure you misread the question. So you may mark a question, put an answer in, and then go back to it at the end if you have some additional time and really scrutinize uh, the stem, the lead-in, and again, make sure that you're answering it, the answer that you are selecting for the correct reasons. So always mark a response to the question, even if you plan to come back to it. The last thing you want to do is leave something blank and then have to go back and read the question again from scratch uh, to decide what you want to do, um, particularly if you're you know, running down to like two minutes left on the exam and you've got two or three of these to take a look at. At least you'll have something in the box, so to speak, if you don't get back to the question. Now, on examination day itself, as much as we have this tendency to want to do that, don't cram the night before. Just get a good night's rest. You are going to be fatigued at the end of the day. And the key is to be alert and really be able to read each of the questions throughout the full approximately 10 hours of your day. Now, when you get into the examination room, you may want to just do a quick mind dump and write down as much as you possibly can in terms of those equations that you memorized out in the parking lot before you checked in. Um, don't study or try to look things up during your breaks. Um, you'll get retroactive inhibition, and for any of you who are not great test takers, it will only build anxiety. Pace yourself. Keep a positive attitude throughout the whole experience. Don't let yourself get down. Many of the questions are difficult, as I stated. There's some that you are not expected to answer correctly. Yes, there will be some experimental questions in there uh, that may leave you scratching your head as to why they're putting those in. So don't beat yourself up too bad um, if you have no idea on certain questions. Remember, most pass on their first attempt, so you're probably going to do just fine on the examination particularly if you took the board review course. If you go through your notes there, practice with seek questions and or other board review question sources, you're going to do great on the examination. So from everyone here on the chess team, best of luck to you. Maintain a positive attitude. Listen, you have prepared and you will succeed. We really wish you the best. And thank you so much for attending the board review course. We'll continue to send question of the day, questions to you all the way up through the examination date. Thanks a lot.